Good morning, Ms. Richards. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, Ms. Gujong. Good morning, Ms. Baker. Um, good morning. Now, you can hear me. I, I t at least one of you can, because you've responded. Um, now, can I identify which is which? I, my apologies. But uh, on the left in our screen, wearing black, um, you are? I'm Marie Gujong. Thank you. Uh, and that means that you, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, wearing uh, a uh, lilac, I suppose, lilac -y pink, I, I, how, how one would describe it. Um, you, you must be Miss Baker. Yes, that's right. Well, w thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you are in separate rooms, I think, uh, in, uh, is it in St Andrew's House or in the Parliament Building? In St Andrew's House, yes. St Andrew's House. Uh, let me describe who you're talking to. Uh, you have a, a small uh, audience, now that we can have uh, an audience back at Fleet Bank House. Uh, the main audience that you're talking to, however, is remote. It'll be uh, around the country watching on uh, YouTube uh, or, or on uh, a, a Twitter feed. Uh, and uh, it, that will be in Scotland uh, as it will be throughout the rest of the UK. Ms. Richards will ask you the questions, but first uh, I shall ask you to take the oath, uh, each in turn. Uh, Mary will, uh, will ask you to, to do that. Mary. Ms. Goujon, can I address you first? Please state your full name. Marie Goujon. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. And if I can turn to you, Ms. Baker. Please state your full name. Samantha Baker. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Ms. Gujon, Ms. Baker, can you see and hear me? Yes. Um, Ms. Gujon, starting with you, if I may, you're currently um, the Minister for Public Health and Sport in the Scots Government, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And you've been in that position since December 2020. Did you hold any ministerial positions prior to that? Yes, I was appointed the Minister of Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment in June 2018 until I became the Minister for Public Health and Sport in December 2020. Um, and um, we know there's been a recent election in Scotland. Do you know whether this is a role you will be continuing in yet? I don't know that yet. The new government is due to be appointed over the coming next few days. Um, now, can you just tell us a little about um, uh, your ministerial responsibilities and your capacity as Minister for Public Health and Sport? Uh, yes, I'm responsible for the testing policy for coronavirus in Scotland, for diet and healthy weight, for other areas of, of public health, for um, uh, abortion policy, for uh, infected blood policy that we're talking about today as well, um, and uh, various other matters that relate to, to public health in Scotland, whether that's relating to uh, smoking, alcohol, uh, and diabetes, uh, lung health, all of those issues. Um, Ms Baker, um, can you tell us please what your role is uh, within the Scottish Government? Yeah, I'm, I'm responsible for infected blood policy and have been since 2016 um, and I also cover a number of other areas including things like blood safety, organ and tissue donation, abortion policy. 
Um, and you're the, a team leader, is, is that correct? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, um, and um, very roughly, what proportion of the work of the team that you lead is made up of in infected blood policy work and, and what proportion is made up of other work? Um, I think, well, it varies um, over time, but at, at the moment I would say probably about a third, but, um, but yes, it, it does vary depending, depending on what's happening with the inquiry and other things. Now, you're both giving evidence this morning effectively as representatives of the Scottish Government, and we'll hear later in the day from Martin Bell, who works for NHS National Services Scotland, which administers the Scottish Infected Blood Support Scheme um, um, on a daily basis. Just so that we can understand the, the, the broad division of responsibilities between the Scottish Government and uh, NHS National Services Scotland, is, is, is this right? Um, the Scottish Government um, set up the, the uh, uh, scheme, set the eligibility requirements, so it decides who can qualify in, in general, and sets the payment levels. And then individual decisions, policies as to precisely how the scheme will operate, what needs to be shown by an applicant and so on, that's dealt with by SIBS. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, Ms Gujon, when you took up your ministerial role, and, and, and as your current ministerial role, which I, I understand from your evidence uh, has only been relatively recent, what knowledge and understanding did you as minister have about the suffering experienced by those who were infected with HIV and hepatitis C and the suffering experienced by their families? Uh, when I was appointed to my role, I was given some briefing on all the different areas of policy within that role as well. So initially it was through that initial briefing that I received, which updated me on the position and, and where we were with that. Um, and although you've only been in post for, I think, some, some six months or so, has your awareness and, and understanding or knowledge of that suffering changed over, over that period of time? Yes, it has. I would say I've, I've gained uh, a greater appreciation and understanding of that as well. I was also keen that when I came into my post, right across the portfolio, because it is quite a broad portfolio to really meet, first of all, all the relevant policy officials, but uh, as well as that, to meet as many stakeholders as possible. So I had met with Haemophilia Scotland and the Scottish Infected Blood Forum. That wasn't until mid-March, I think that was uh, around the 15th or 16th of March, that I met with them. Ms Baker, um, you, you told us you've been in your current post since 2016. Uh, um, yes. Again, a similar question to you. When you took up that post, what knowledge or understanding did you as team leader have about the suffering experienced uh, by those infected with hepatitis C and HIV um, and their families? Well, I think it was quite limited before I started. Um, obviously, I'd, I'd heard about it in the media and I'd heard about the Penrose inquiry, um, but I didn't know a huge amount of detail until I applied for this job and then obviously did quite a bit of reading before starting. And then once I started the post, um, did a lot of reading up and getting to, to meet people. And, you know, similar to Ms. Goujon, I met a number of infected and affected and other people involved and, and that obviously helped to broaden my understanding about the issues and, and what had happened and um, the impacts that that had had on those who are infected and affected. And um, has that knowledge and understanding changed and, and deepened over the, the years in which you've been involved in this area of policy? Yes, I, I think so. I mean, I think um, there's, there's, you know, it's such such a broad and complex area that that I am still still learning and still developing my understanding about things like HIV and hepatitis C and the impacts they have. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, some questions about the origins of the Scottish uh, Infected Blood Support Scheme, and um, th these questions will be largely directed. These next few questions will be largely directed to you, Ms. Baker. Um, 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 given um, your involvement since 2016. Um, now, the, the Scottish in Infected Blood Support Scheme took over from the Alliance House organisations in April 2017. C 
Can you yes. assist us with understanding why it was set up as a scheme administered by NHS National Services Scotland? Um, well, I think we looked in 2016 at a number of options um, for organisations that could run the scheme. Um, the uh, Financial re Review Group had recommended that there should be a separate Scottish scheme. Um, so when, when I joined um, this team, there was, um, part of my job was, was to set up the new scheme and, and take that forward. Um, so we did look at, for example, um, whether we could appoint an external organisation, um, but, but we understood we would need to go through a, an official journal of the EU tender process for that. We looked at setting up a new public body. Uh, we looked at the independent living fund as an option. Um, but um, somebody suggested that National Services Scotland had the, the systems and ability to, to make these kind of payments and relevant experience. So I also looked into that as an option that spoke to the chief executive. And as a result of that, we we sort of weighed up the pros and cons of the various options and agreed with the, the cabinet secretary at the time that National Services Scotland would be the best option um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, to make sure that the scheme could be set up relatively quickly. Um, also, in terms of cost effectiveness, the, the administrative costs were likely to be lower through that option than through some of the other options, such as tendering. Um, and, and as I say, they already had the, the relevant IT systems and staff in place who could who could run the scheme and project manage the, the setting up and so on. Now, is this right that prior to the Scottish scheme taking over in April 2017, higher payments for those regarded as Scottish claimants, if I can put it that way, as the Scottish cohort, had in fact begun the year earlier and had been paid by the Scottish Government via Skipton and MFET Limited for the 2016-2017 financial year, is that right? Yes, yes. Um, um, I think it was March 2016 that the then Cabinet Secretary announced that she was accepting the recommendations of the Financial Review Group. So at that point we knew that it would take some time to set up SIBs um, and that it wasn't going to be something that could be done in a few months. So um, we looked at making interim payments where we could through MFET and Skipton. That took longer than we had hoped um, because there was a number of changes to agreements that were required. Um, but I think it was December 2016 that they started paying those extra lump sums and the higher annual payments. Now, we'll, we'll look at, in a moment at the report of the Financial Review Group upon which the um, um, SIBS uh, scheme was in part based. But, but before we do that, can you assist us with this? What, what was it that led the Scottish Government to set up the Financial Review Group and ask it to report on financial support? I, well, I have to say I wasn't in post at that point, um, but my understanding is that um, after the Penrose inquiry, um, the Penrose inquiry didn't specifically look at financial support um, so I think the Cabinet Secretary at the time felt there was a need to consider, um, she was aware that there was some unhappiness amongst beneficiaries about the, the existing payment levels and the Alliance House arrangements. Um, and that's why she, she asked for a financial review to be undertaken. Um, and were there financial limits or parameters imposed by the Scottish Government on, on, on the proposals that could be made by the Financial Review Group? Not that I'm aware of, but as I say, I wasn't, I wasn't here at the time when, when the Financial Review Group was going on or when it was underway. Um, if we look at the report, Shane Mick, it's WITN 4508014. Uh, we can see there 
Financial Review Group final report, Contaminated Blood, Financial Support Conclusions and Recommendations. And I think it was published in, in late 2015. If we could go to um, the second page, please, Shona. I'm just going to go through it, in, in part just to um, pr provide some structure for the questions I'm going to ask you and, th and then ask you a number of questions. So we can see under the heading conclusions, um, if we look at the very bottom of the page, left-hand column, So picking up the last three lines on the left-hand column, the group's discussions are summarised at Chapter 3. They concluded that although the situation had been improved to some extent, and then if we go to the top of the next column, by the 2011 Contaminated Blood Review, there was still significant unmet need among those affected a combination of pain, suffering, and associated financial loss had irrevocably altered the lives of those affected. Many had died from their infection, leaving their families to deal not only with grief, but long-term loss of support. Carers had sacrificed their own careers and opportunities because of their caring responsibilities. Although it's impossible to place a monetary value on these experiences, the group are of the view that the depth of the physical and emotional suffering involved can only be addressed by introducing new financial support arrangements. And then if we go to the next page, we can see the key recommendations. So we can see the first key recommendation is in relation to annual payments. And the first bullet point tells us the recommendation is the annual payments for HIV and advanced hepatitis C, currently known as stage two, should be increased from 15,000 per annum to 27,000 per annum to reflect Scottish full-time gross medium income. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, and then there's a recommendation of the amounts that should be paid in relation to the co-infected. Um, and then if we go to the top of the next page, sorry, same page, Shomik, um, top, top of the page, right-hand column, we can see that the second proposal was supporting widows and widowers when the primary recipient dies, the increased annual payment should convert into a pension for surviving spouses of 75% of the relevant level of annual payment. Um, and then the next bullet point tells us that the proposed annual payment should continue for a full year after the date of death of the primary recipient and thereafter convert into payment at 75% per annum to the spouse until death. Um, so that's the payment for uh, widows and widowers. And then if we look at proposal three... bottom of the page thank you increased lump sum payment for chronic hepatitis c infection and we can see there the first bullet point refers to the the, the ross expert group which we've looked at in earlier inquiry hearings um, um report recommendation related to chronic infection with hepatitis c should be fulfilled that is all those chronically infected with hepatitis c should receive a fifty thousand pound lump sum payment and then if we go over the page Sorry, it's the page before that, show me. Proposal for support and assistance grants. I'm not going to go through the detail of that, but that's discretionary one-off grants, as I understand it. Um, uh, and then proposal five, further work. I'll come back to that. And then if we just look at the next page, operation of the scheme... We can see a number of matters there set out. Uh, none of these proposals should require recipients to sign any sort of waiver to prevent individual legal action for damages, etc. A new Scottish scheme should be established that is sensitive to the unique Scottish context. This should encompass current and future HIV and hepatitis C beneficiaries. And then if we look at the right-hand column, appeals mechanism, a credible transparent appeals mechanism should be established for all parts of the improved schemes. Applicants should be able to appear in person at their appeal and bring an appropriate representative. Accountability. The new structures established in Scotland should have effective patients involved in governance slash oversight. The group agreed as a principle that nobody should receive less financial support due to the new arrangements. The same level of support should at least be maintained. And then finally, any new arrangements should be subject to periodic future review to ensure that they're fit for purpose. 
um, now I've not gone through it obviously line by line, but is it right to understand that these are the proposals and recommendations that form the basis then of the SIB scheme? Yes, that's correct. And I think um, it's Ms Goujon's witness statement which tells us that the then Cabinet Secretary confirmed that the Scottish Government accepted the recommendations for future financial support and would be implementing them um, in the first half of 2016. Yes, that's correct. Could, can you just assist us whilst we still have this um, page open on the screen with the second bullet point on the left-hand side? It refers to establishing a new scheme, a new Scottish scheme that should be sensitive to the unique Scottish context. Are you able to assist us in understanding what, 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 what the Scottish Government's understanding was of, of the unique Scottish context? Is that, that for me? Yes. Um, um, I suppose, um, as, as I say, I, I wasn't involved in the group, so I can't, I can't say exactly what they, they meant by that, I'm afraid. But um, I suppose that there is, there is um, a, a cl close-knit set of um, people um, involved um, who, who've been involved in campaigning over the years and who've, who've gone through the Penrose inquiry. Um, but I'm, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know to what extent um, the Scottish context is is unique. But obviously, um, people, some people were were very keen to have a, a, a scheme that was Scottish, if you like, that was more local to them, perhaps more more responsive, um, smaller. You know, that they were able to to phone up and speak to an individual that they would know. Um, but but it, it's difficult for me to speculate because, as I say, I didn't write the report, so I, I don't know what they, they meant by it, I'm afraid. Um, and, and then if we could go to page nine, please. Um, under the heading key points, we can see the first bullet point is the group favoured a new Scottish scheme that would not be constrained by UK-wide discussion slash agreement. Now, Ms. Baker, I'm conscious, obviously, as you've said, you weren't in, in post at the time this, this report was produced, or indeed at the time that the then Cabinet Secretary accepted its recommendations. Um, I'm going to be asking both of you later about discussions that have taken place more recently between the four nations, um, the UK-wide discussions. But um, have you become aware... Uh, since taking up your post in 2016 of, of, of any particular concerns about difficulties with UK-wide discussions uh, in, in previous years? Are you, you able to assist us with what was meant by the, the concern about constraints here? Yes, I mean, I think, uh, well, under the Alliance House arrangements, um, in order to make any changes to, to any of the schemes or particularly around... Um, Things like annual payment levels, or lump sums, or or even discretionary through the um, through the the three the well the Caxton Foundation, the and um, McFarlane and Eileen Trust. Um, you need you needed basically four nations agreement to that, and that was quite difficult, I guess, because everybody had to agree and be able to provide additional funding. Um, and I know there had been difficulties. Um, for example, the, the former cabinet secretary had um, asked if an you know, interim additional um, higher winter fuel payment could be made um, by, by the schemes um, as, while, while the financial review was going on. But, but because there wasn't Four Nations agreement to that, that, that couldn't happen. They couldn't just implement that for Scottish beneficiaries, which, which I, you know, I understand the reasons for that. But, but obviously, it, it, it did make it much more difficult to, to, to make changes because you needed all four nations to agree to something. And, and then if we look at the second bullet point, it says this, there was at least some discussion about the court-style um, damages model, but also a view that the group should be trying to address current gaps, shortcomings, helping those in need. And then it says the court-style model was not supported by the consultation exercise. Now, again, I'm not going to ask you about the Financial Review Group's views on, on, on that because you were not involved, but um, um, what, if any, consideration has the Scottish Government given, um, either 
um, in, in the uh, uh, setting up of the SIB scheme or subsequently to such a model? To be honest, we, we haven't given it much consideration because um, obviously it wasn't part of what the financial review group recommended. So um, we followed what largely what the review group was recommending and, and didn't consider alternatives because there wasn't um, significant calls for it. And was any consideration given by the Scottish Government, um, to your knowledge, to the model used in the Republic of Ireland, either at the time of setting up SIBs or, or subsequently? Um, I'm not aware. I, I understand it was discussed within the financial review group. They looked at um, various models and, and talked about it. But, but as I say, as the financial review group recommended a particular model, we, we didn't then investigate the Irish model further. And then if we just go over the page, please, Shamek, to, to the next page. If we look at the first paragraph left-hand side under the heading Proposal 1 Annual Payments, um, we can see, um, and we saw it in the, in the summary as well, um, those who are receiving, for those who are receiving ex gratia annual payments, those payments should be increased so that they're in line with the Scottish gross median income for full-time employees. And then the next bullet point that says these annual payments will ensure nobody is in poverty and will reflect historic and future financial loss for those most affected by in, in infections. Now, um, first of all, um, is it right to understand from the fact that the Scottish Government accepted this report and set up SIBs in the way that it did, that the basis for, for choosing the, the amount of annual payments was as set out here to reflect the Scottish gross medium income for full-time employees? Effectively, I, I think so. As, as I say, I wasn't involved directly. I mean, I, I think that that was the intention. Um, I think it is noted actually elsewhere in the report that, that as the payments are um, not subject to income tax, the pay, payment level was actually higher than the gross median income, in fact. But, um, but I think, um, as I say, I wasn't involved in, in the discussions when the Cabinet Secretary accepted the recommendations. But, but I understand that, that she accepted that, that the arguments put forward by the re review group were reasonable in relation to that. Okay. Now the, the, the second bullet point, and again, I'm conscious that this is the report of the group and with which you had, had, had no involvement at the time, but the second bullet point says these annual payments will ensure nobody's in poverty and will reflect historic and future financial loss for those most affected. Now, a proposal that, as implemented through SIBs, that there would be... Um, annual payments from 2000, April 2017 onwards, one might be able to see how that could encompass an element of um, meeting future financial loss. Um, are, are you able to assist from the Scottish Government or your own team's perspective um, with the suggestion here that um, this would, these annual payments would somehow reflect historic loss? I'm afraid, uh, as I say, I, I, I didn't write the report, so I don't, I don't know how it was written. I mean, I think generally the annual payments are seen to to support people's day-to-day -day living costs, so they they're not really about historic financial loss. But um, but but yeah, we um, we we certainly didn't didn't question how the report had been drafted. Um, now, has um, a full assessment of the, n of the needs of those infected and their families or, or, or of the losses experienced by them ever been commissioned or undertaken by the Scottish Government, to, to your knowledge? Not, not a full assessment. I mean, certainly we've done, uh, via SIBS, we've, um, they've, they've run beneficiary surveys, which I appreciate is not, doesn't, constitute a full assessment, but um, um, it, it's there to sort of gauge how people are feeling. Um, but we, we don't, and we've never had access to people's contact details or personal data to, to really be able to do a full assessment. And um, are you able to assist with, with this 
Um, when SIBS was set up and as it's operated subsequently, means testing has been retained, as, as I understand it, for a part of the scheme. So it's retained in relation to applications for discretionary uh, grants and, and, and elements of discretionary support. Um, w why did the Scottish Government, um, uh, or what, in setting up SIBS, include an element of means testing? Um, I think we've, we've tried to move away from means testing gradually. Uh, we're aware that, that a lot of beneficiaries don't like it, and I, I absolutely understand why they don't. Um, I think initially, um, with the support and assistance grants, we weren't sure how much demand there would be for it. Um, so we felt, and, and you know, I think it's somewhat acknowledged in the Financial Review Group's report that, that um, while clearly the annual payments are not means tested in any way, nor are the lump sums that, that may be um, the fairest way to, to allocate discretionary funding was, was through means testing. But as I say, we've, we've moved away from that as much as we can, um, largely by increasing the, the annual payments, um, firstly through the financial review and then, then through the clinical review later on. And now, obviously, the, the new increases that, that we'll be making in the next few months will will hopefully mean that the people shouldn't need one-off grants or income supports that they have in the past. So that, that should move away the, the means testing as much as possible. Now, the, 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 the documents that form the, the, as well, the architecture of the scheme, I think, comprise a, a scheme document made by Scottish ministers. I'm not, I'm not going to go um, to, to that. I don't have any specific questions arising out of it. Um, and also a memorandum of understanding between Scottish ministers and uh, um, National Support Services Scotland. Um, uh, uh, sorry, National Services Scotland. And I just want to ask um, both of you a question arising out of that. Shame it. Could we have WITN 4728006, please? So we can see this is entitled Scottish Ministers and National Services Scotland Memorandum of Agreement in Respect of the Operation of the Scottish Infected Blood Support Scheme. Um, and, and there's just one question I have, if we go to the second page. If we look at the recitals, about a third of the way down, paragraph one, it says a scheme has been established in Scotland for the making of ex gratia payments to scheme beneficiaries, as defined below, who are persons affected by infected blood. And, and then it goes on to provide for the appointment of NSS to administer the payments. I um, wanted to ask bo both of you, and I'll perhaps start with Ms. Goujon with, with this, what, what the Scottish Government's understanding, or your understanding is, of the, the concept of ex gratia payments and, and, and why that's the basis for the, uh, the current system. I, to be honest, I, I, I don't know why that was determined to be the, the basis for the current system. I just know that the, the way that the, the system was designed was on the back of the, the recommendations of the, the financial review group. Um, I don't know if Sam would have any further information to add to that. Ms Baker? Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> To be honest, um, as you, you'll be aware, the, the previous Alliance House schemes were always run on an ex gratia basis. Um, so I, I think I don't think we gave it too much consideration. Um, that's you know the, our, our lawyers had drafted this agreement and included that, but it, it wasn't something I specifically um, instructed them on. But but yes, I, I think it was assumed to be on an ex gratia basis. If we then just go back to the report of the Financial Review Group, um, WITN 4508014. And could we go to the last page of the document, please, Shamik? Oh, I'm sorry, the page before that. So this is Annex D Scottish Infected Blood Forum, um, and 
and it's an, a note of dissent to the report and recommendations um, of the financial review group. And we can see that um, if we look at the, first of all, at the left-hand column, bottom half of the page, there are a number of um, areas of disagreement expressed um, by the Scottish Infected Blood Forum. Um, the um, uh, first three relate to the retention of the distinction between stage one and stage two, and the um, lack of recognition of, of the significant levels of health impacts of, of uh, um, those who are termed stage one patients. Um, we then, at the bottom of the page, um, see that uh, it's being said that the proposed financial settlement for the stage one patient victims, so that the, uh, the lump sum payment doesn't present any increase on the original recommendations, if we go to the top of the next page, laid down by Lord Ross, nor does it incorporate any inflationary impact dating back to, to the time of the Ross report in 2003 or before. Um, there's then, uh, in the next bullet point, the last three lines of the next bullet point says that the cons consultation process didn't include the opportunity for people to formally detail their losses, either actual or estimated, and then there's a lack of recognition of the clear majority view among patient victims to see lump sum payments as preferable to just annual payments. Um, now, um, I'm, I'm not going to ask, in, in, in light of um, the, the fact that you weren't in post at the time this report was being considered by the Cabinet Secretary, Ms Baker, to uh, tell us what was made of this by the Cabinet Secretary, but can you assist with this? What, if any, consideration has the Scottish Government given since the report of the Financial Review Group, so since the time you've been in post and SIBS has been set up and run, to the concerns expressed here? Um, well, I think I was, I was certainly aware, as, as you say, I wasn't directly involved in this, but I was, I was aware of the dissent and I was aware, I think if you read the rest of the report and the, the comments from the consultation, I was aware that there was by no means um, a clear consensus on, on what everybody wanted from, from the consultation process they went through. Um, so we were always aware that, that the, the steps we took in setting up SIBs were only a first step. Um, part, the main part of, of the, the actions we took, I think, to, to try and address the concerns that were raised here by SIBF is, is, was around the clinical review. Um, it took a little bit of time to set that up because we were initially focusing on getting the, the new payments out, first, first through Skitton and then MFDT and then through setting up SIPs. Um, but we did around, I think, spring 2017, um, then turn our attention to the clinical review and get that set up. And that started working around the summer of 2017. And, and we were clear that um, the, the sort of work that SIPS was doing initially was, was only um, a starter, if you like, um, and that there were still points to be addressed in relation to the stage one group in particular, because um, we recognised that um, the, the SIBF and a number of beneficiaries were not happy with, with the outcome. You know, obviously they welcomed the extra £30,000 lump sum, but, but felt that there should be additional support and additional recognition of the, the mental health impacts of hepatitis C and the extra hepatic manifestations, if you like. Um, so, that, so that's what we, we took forward through the clinical review to try and consider that in more detail because I think, well, as, as I say, I'm, I, I can't speak for the review group, but as I understand it, they, they felt it needed um, expert clinician involvement to, to look in more detail at those issues and, and they didn't feel able to, to provide specific recommendations at the time, which is why I think one of the recommendations was to have a further clinical review. Okay, I will look at the clinical review in a moment. Um, um, if, if we just t taking up the the point in this note of dissent that the consultation process didn't include the opportunity for people to formally detail their losses, either actual or estimated, would it be right to understand, um, I think from an answer you gave to one of my earlier questions, Ms Baker, that th the Scottish Government has, um, has never um, uh, um, invited those in infected and affected to formally detail their losses, e either actual or estimated? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, and in terms of the um, the next issue in the uh, in the next bullet point, 
the possibility of lump sum payments is preferable to just annual payments. And, and that was something which the Financial Review Group, I think, suggested that might be further thought given to, pro providing that as an option to individuals. Has anything further been done by the Scottish Government in relation to that issue? Um, well, we have had some discussions, but progress has, has been limited. It, it was one of the things we were going to take forward, but actually, um, once, once this inquiry started, we felt it was best to, to wait, particularly given that the um, points raised about ensuring parity between the schemes and, and none, of, none of the other schemes in the UK were, were looking at that. But we've always said we, we are willing to look at lump, lump sum payments for those individuals who want that, but um, we weren't clear that it was a good time to take it forward, both when the inquiry was looking at um, financial support, but also as, as the payment levels have changed several times over the years and are about to change again, um, clearly we don't we wouldn't want anybody to, to accept a lump sum payment and then then lose out if, if payments were increased in future. And sorry, if, I, if I'm able to, to add to that, it was really to say that this was a, a matter that was raised with me at the meeting that I had, that I mentioned with Haemophilia Scotland and the Scottish Infected Blood Forum as well. And it, it, you know, basically, just as, as Sam said there, that especially given the ongoing discussions with, with parity, it's not something that the Scottish Government has, has ruled out at all by any means, but felt it was better to wait until those discussions had been finalised so that nobody would be disadvantaged if the payment levels changed. And, and we'll come on to the parity discussions um, in, in due course. Um, thank you. Um, and then um, d d just picking up on the clinical review, before we look at the document itself, we know that the English Infected Blood Support Scheme introduced um, the special category mechanism from September 2017, and that was a mechanism for the stage one hepatitis C sufferers to receive a, a higher payment. Um, it, are you aware of any particular reason why the Scottish Government didn't follow suit and, and, and introduce something similar, um, either when it set up SIBS in 2000, April 2017 or, or, or when the English scheme introduced uh, this type of payment in, in September 2017? Ms Baker. Um, well, we, we did ask the clinical review as soon as we became aware of the, the English Infected Blood Support Scheme plans. Um, for the special category mechanism, we did ask the clinical review group, I think, to look at that and, and consider it um, as part of their deliberations. Um, so, so it was considered, but I, it, it wasn't something that was favoured by by the review group as a whole, certainly not as a whole. Um, so, so that's why we didn't adopt it. If we look then at the clinical review group, uh, the clinical review report, Shay Mick, that's. GGCL 40168, please. Uh, we can see the, the report that's headed Clinical Review of the Impact of Hepatitis C Short Life Working Group Report for the Scottish Government, um, informing decision making on awards of people without advanced hepatitis C disease who were infected with hepatitis C through NHS blood transfusion treatment with blood products and for their widows, widowers, civil partners or long-term partners. And we can see the date, May 2018. Um, if we just, for, by way of background, go to page five. I think just so that we can pick up the timing in the first paragraph under the heading background, we're told here that in mid-2017, the Scottish Government asked Professor Goldberg to establish and preside over an expert group to assess the health and well-being of individuals chronically affected with hepatitis C virus, previously often known as Skipton stage one. Um, and then if we go to page nine, I think, so I just want to pick up the key recommendation at the bottom of the page. We can see, um, picking it up in the last two lines of the first bullet point, to address this dilemma, the clinical review group favours unanimously the following approach. Um, people with chronic hepatitis C, including those who've cleared their virus through treatment, or their widows, widower or partners, um, who are currently C 
SIBS beneficiaries or who become eligible to be SIBS beneficiaries in the future should be asked to self-declare hepatitis C impact in the following simple way. Um, and then we see three categories. If they themselves considered that their hepatitis C had not appreciably, appreciably affected their life, they would not be eligible for a chronic HCV annual payment award. And then the second uh, is if they themselves considered that their or their spouse's partner's hepatitis C had seriously affected and continued to affect their life, they would be eligible for a chronic HCV award at a higher level if they themselves considered that their or their spouse's partner's hepatitis C had affected and continued to affect their life, but not seriously, they would be eligible for a chronic HCV award at a lower level. Um, and then if we just go down the page, we can see the recommendation in the next bullet point. Accordingly, those applying for a chronic HCV award would have to declare themselves in one of two categories. A definition of serious would be provided to assist the decision making. Um, this definition would be to the satisfaction of the clinical review group. There would be no requirement for the applicant to justify the application in the category they declared themselves in. The process would be entirely based on trusting the judgment of the potential applicant. There would be no requirement for a healthcare professional to be involved. In the context of the available evidence as outlined in this report and the vast collective experience of its members, the clinical review group deemed this approach to be optimal for the following reasons. It has patient and healthcare professional support. It is simple to administer. It aims to ensure that those with the greatest need receive the greatest benefit. It avoids patient healthcare professional conflict and any need for an appeals process. It reduces stress among applicants to a minimum. It is person-centered recognizing that the individual's perception of hepatitis C is critical. It promotes both individual and collective responsibility and it sends out a loud and clear message saying you are trusted to make the appropriate declaration. Um, it, uh, and again, I'll, I think Ms. Ms. Baker, is, is it right to understand that this is the system that the Scottish Government then decided to implement, a system, as it were, of, of self-declaration? Um, yes, effectively. Um, and um, why in particular was that approach chosen? Um, well, ob obviously that, that was what the review group recommended. I, I wasn't part of the review group. I, um, I think I attended the first meeting to, to talk about the sort of context and the terms of reference, but, um, but we deliberately didn't involve ourselves in it as we wanted to be, to make sure it was an independent process. Um, but yeah, we, we, we considered what the review group had recommended and, and um, advised, advised ministers around it um, and also considered with SIP staff how, how it would work and how it would operate. Um, and I, th I think we agreed that, that what the review group was saying was appropriate for the reasons they, they set out. Um, I know that, from, well, from speaking to people who were involved, I, I understand certainly that clinicians had concerns about sort of having to, to sign off, if you like, or, or give an opinion and, and difficulties associated with that. Um, so I think it was certainly felt that, that it was best for individuals to do that themselves. Um, I know, I know there was some concerns how, how it would work in practice and we had some difficulties trying to make sure that the guidance was um, easy enough to understand, if you like, and, and clear enough um, for people to be able to, to, to make a decision about which category they should come into. Um, but, but ministers the ministers at the time accepted that, that the, the approach was sensible. I think we, we have... Um, implemented some some sort of slight changes for example if people um self-declared in one category and then decide they want to change them we, we do ask or, or sibs does ask them to to provide a, a letter of support from a medical professional in that case but but generally speaking um we felt it was appropriate to let people make their own decision um uh, and then i think we understand from Ms. Gujon's statement that um although she wasn't involved at the time that this was implemented with effect from I think, the autumn of 2018. What, why was it not backdated to the inception of, of, of SIBS in April 2017? That for me or? For yeah, sorry, for you, Ms. Baker, yes. Um, I, I think, well, 
I, I, I don't remember to be honest, but, but I think um, certainly in terms of, um, you know, there would have been financial considerations about, about you know, um, finding additional funding. Um, but I, I think I think there was a discussion about what date it would be backdated to, but but it was only felt to be realistic to backdate it to to that financial year. I think it was first of September, twenty eighteen, was backdated to. But I, unfortunately, I don't I don't remember there being any discussions about backdating before before twenty eighteen at all. Um, and we can take that down. Thank you, um, Chair Mick. I then have some more general questions about the, the Scottish Government's um, rationale for an approach to the scheme, and, and these will be directed to um, both of you. Um, um, starting with Ms Gujon, and then I'll ask Ms Baker if you have anything to add. What's the Scottish Government's um, understanding of why these payments are made. What are the sums intended to, to, to be for? I think it's to recognise the, the impact that this has had on people's lives, how they've been impacted, their ability to work or if they're unable to work. So I believe that that's what the, the payments are, are there for. Ms Baker? Well, nothing to add, really. I think what Ms. Gujon has said is, is, is what I would have said. Um, would it be right to understand that they're, they're not intended to be compensatory in nature um, as the scheme is currently constructed? I believe that would be correct, yes. Um, and uh, I think it's probably clear from the answers Ms Baker has, has, has already um, given to earlier questions, but would you both accept that the scheme doesn't account for or compensate for past loss for the SIBS members? Is that for me or It's for really for both of you, minister. so perhaps you first, okay. Ms Baker. Um, yes, I think that's correct. I mean, I, I guess... To some extent, the lump sum payments when people join or change categories, you know, from stage one to stage two, um, I, I guess they they are an element of recognition for, for past loss. But but as you say, it, it's it's really about people's living costs for now and in the future. Make sure that they can live um, reasonably comfortably if they're not able to to work and. Um, ensure that they have some security for the future, that they know they're going to continue to get the payments. Okay. Ms. Ms. Gujon? Uh, yeah, and I would agree with what Sam Baker has just outlined. Um, and uh, again, this is a, a broad question. It's not tailored to any particular aspect of the, the current scheme, but um, what, what does the Scottish Government see its responsibility as being? I, I don't mean in a legal sense. Here, but does it consider it has effectively a moral responsibility through the current scheme to address, in, in some measure at least, the impact of what has happened? Yes, I believe that they do. Ms Baker? Yes, yes I, I believe so. And, and then again, a broad question, um, what, what role has devolution played in the um, approach of the Scottish Government to uh, the um, system for financial support? Ms Baker. Um, well, obviously, as, as a, a devolved scheme, we've always wanted to, to respond to Scottish beneficiaries' needs, if, if you like, and, and take account of those, particularly where they're different. We recognise that, that there's a lot of common issues uh, across the UK but but where where there's things that that we can or should do differently then then I think devolution in the spirit of devolution we should be able to do that but um, obviously decisions regarding the scheme are uh, for ministers to take. Um, now I've just got a um, 
couple of questions on uh, some specific elements of, of, of the scheme, which, uh, again, I think I'll, these questions will be directed to you, Ms. Ms. Baker, probably most usefully. Um, if we look, first of all, at WITN 4728001, please. This is the statement of Mr. Bell, who will be giving evidence um, later today. If we could go to page 18 of this statement. And if we could just look at question 21 and the answer at question, uh, paragraph 21.1. Um, you'll see there the question is um, about implementation uh, of backdating payments uh, and um, uh, um, the answer that's given at 21.1, SIBS did not consider backdating payments for first-time registrants to one, the date of diagnosis, two, the date of first eligibility for support, or three, the date upon which SIBS was established. The policy set by Scottish Government is to backdate payments to the date an application is received by SIBS. Um, Ms Baker, are, are you able to assist us in understanding why the Scottish Government's decision in terms of um, uh, the backdating policy described here um, was to backdate to the date an application was received rather than date of diagnosis or, or date of eligibility for support? I'm afraid I, I don't know the details, but I understand that that was the approach taken by the, the former scheme, Skipton Fund and so on. And so we, we had followed that. And I know, well, all my understanding is that that's the same approach taken in, in the other UK schemes as well. Um, um, so it, 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 is, is this right to understand, um, if you're able to answer this, Ms Baker, that it was effectively done because it was a continuation of, the, of what was understood to be the existing system rather than through an independent consideration of the, the, the appropriate policy by the Scottish Government? Um, yes, I think that's correct. Um, and then if we go back to the um, Financial Review Group report, again, there's a sp specific issue I want to ask you arising out of that. It's WITN 4508014, please. And if we go to page 13, please, Shomik. Um, under the heading oh. Proposal 5, further work, we, we, I've asked you about the issue about lump sum payments, which was the first bullet point. The second bullet point um, in terms of recommendation for further work was that access to insurance products and additional loading of premiums due to infections should be given further consideration. Um, are, are you able to assist us with what, if any, further consideration has been given by the Scottish Government to this matter? Yeah, um, I'm afraid... It we would have liked to have done more, but it, the, we just haven't had the time to address it yet. But it is something that, that we've said and I've discussed with the minister that we would be keen to, to try and take forward UK-wide. I, I think there would be um, a better chance of, of um, having successful engagement with the, the big insurance firms if we did that on a UK-wide basis. Um, I think the statement of... Well, one of the statements of Sally Richards, um, who is involved with SIBS, not, not just self-giving oral evidence, um, suggests that the Scottish Government did, intends to take forward some work in relation to this, but doesn't have the capacity to do so at the moment due to workload. Is, is that correct? And is, if that is correct, is there any way that can be addressed? Um, yes, I, I, I think that's correct. Um, I... We, we have obviously been trying to, to get additional uh, additional staff to help, um, but yeah, I, I would I would hope it's something we could take forward reasonably soon. But but it has been difficult with with a number of pieces of work around infected blood in in uh, the last few years. Ms. Um, Gijan, from a ministerial perspective. Are, are you able to say whether um, this is something which the Scottish Government considers is important and, and should be given further consideration? 
Yes, I think it is important and something we want to give further consideration to. And again, this was another matter that um, was raised at the, the meeting I had on the, the 16th of March. So I know that this is an issue and certainly from my perspective, uh, I believe that that's something we should look at. Um, and, and Ms Baker, is it right as a matter of fact to understand that um, uh, for whatever reason, it's th this is an issue which has not been the subject of any particular further work since the financial review group report which was obviously now a number of years ago yeah i i, I believe uh, somebody in my team may have done a, a little bit of invest, initial investigation work but it never never got very far i'm afraid um, and, and i'll be coming on to the the more recent discussions about parity in, in a little while but is is this issue the issue of access to insurance products and loading of premiums a matter that's been raised at all in the in the discussions between the four nations? Um, I think I may have raised it recently, but, but it's certainly not something that I remember being raised um, over the sort of five years or so that I've been in the post. Um, but certainly it's something that I, I did indicate recently that, that I felt we should try and discuss further in future. The, uh, um, we looked in, in this report earlier at a reference to the appeals process um, for SIBS. I'm not going to ask you anything about the detail of the appeals process, but one of the features recommended by the Financial Review Group, and as I understand it, accepted by the Scottish Government, was that um, applicants would be able to appear in person at a meeting of the appeals panel. Um, and, and we know from other evidence the inquiries heard that wasn't a feature of the of the Skipton scheme. Um, do, do, do you know why um, that was seen as, Im, as important by the Scottish Government, Ms Baker? Um, I think, well, as I've already said, I, I can't speak for what the, the review group said in its report, but I, I think that people felt that it was important for the individual to be able to, to put their pay, case in person, if you like, rather than, than just being, you know, a, a pay, a, the appeals panel considering the paperwork, if you like, so, so they could explain the circumstances and answer questions. Um, and we, we felt that was reasonable. And obviously it's a bit easier in Scotland for, for people in terms of travel um, for people to, to attend in person than it would have been for example, if the appeals panel was in London. And we can take that down. Thank you, Shamit. Um, Ms. Guzman, you've referred to um, uh, you yourself having had a meeting with, um, with campaigners, with Haemophilia Scotland, the Scottish Infected Blood Forum. M more generally, does the Scottish Government regard it as important to involve the infected and affected communities in decision-making about the scheme? Yes, I think that's really important that we get their feedback on how it's operating and that we we listen to their ideas and suggestions. Uh, they're the ones that are most affected by it, so I think it's absolutely vital that, that we we listen to them. Um, and, and, and Ms Baker, over the years since 2017, how has the Scottish Government um, a, a, attempted to secure the involvement of the infected and affected communities in decision-making? Um, I think, well, through a number of ways, there's been fairly regular engagement between ministers and um, the, the organisations such as Haemophilia Scotland, Scottish Infected Blood Forum. They've met or communicated, written to each other fairly regularly. Um, you'll be aware SIBS also has an advisory group which provides an opportunity um, for for SIBS and, and we also attend that as observers for us to, to get feedback um, and in addition to that we've uh, liaised with the SIBS staff on on surveys and they've done two surveys since since they started one one was an initial survey after I think about a year of operation and then a more in-depth survey after three years to, to try to get feedback on what what was working well and what wasn't working well with the scheme now, I wanted to ask next about how the funding for, for financial support uh, and for SIBs operates at, 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 a, at a macro level. Um, Ms. Gushan, is, th is this correct um, that 
SIBS is, is funded by the Scottish Government. The levels of funding for SIBS are determined by the Scottish Government in the annual spending reviews. Um, and then there is a contribution of funding from the Department of Health and Social Care towards the cost of payments for, for HIV. Is that broadly correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, and in, in leaving aside for a moment the contribution from the Department of Health and Social Care, which I'll, I'll ask about in a moment, um, is there any particular budget that the allocation of money from the Scottish Government to SIBS is drawn from? Um, either Ms Guzman or Ms Baker, whoever's able to assist with that. It's, it's, well, it comes from the, the overall health and social care budget. Um, within that, each, each division of, of the Scottish Government has its own budget, so um, as part of our division's budget, we have a budget for the Scottish Defective Love Support. Now, why does the funding for, uh, for the HIV payments operate differently? Why is funding received from the Department of Health and Social Care? Ms. Gujan, can, can you assist with that? Uh, yes, I believe that that had uh, initially been the case, or uh, that may have been, or, or Sam, I'm sure, will correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on, on any of these uh, details. Uh, but I think it comes on the back of the Alliance House schemes. I think there had been some discussion with the previous Cabinet Secretary perhaps around 2016, 2017, about the future of HIV funding and whether uh, whether or not DHSE would be continuing those payments. And uh, I believe there was some discussion about that and whether or not that should be for the Scottish Government to fund through Barnet consequentials. But I don't think the conversation developed any further from that, from what I'm, from what I'm led to believe. And DHSE, instead of looking at uh, funding the, the Scottish Government through Barnet consequentials, decided to continue to make those payments. Ms Baker, do, do you have any further light you can shed on, on, on why um, the Department of Health and Social Care makes this contribution in respect of HIV payments? Yeah, it, I mean, it effectively, it's, as, as the Minister said, um, uh, I think the UK government always funded the... Um, McFarlane Trust, the, or the ongoing costs of the McFarlane Trust, the Eileen Trust, and MFET. Um, so those were always funded centrally, whereas Skipton and Caxton, we always contributed towards the cost of the, the Scottish beneficiaries. Um, so it was only in around 2016, I think, when the UK government was looking at scheme reform that they started to talk about um, us needing to contribute to those costs. Um, as, as the Minister said, there was some discussion with the former Cabinet Secretary where she agreed that that was fine in principle, but, but that um, under the normal arrangements we should receive a fine consequential for that because um, we had never received any, as far as we were aware, never received any fine consequential from the UK Government following devolution in relation to the HIV schemes. Um, so. We proposed that, but um, then the Department of Health came back and suggested that instead they would continue providing HIV funding rather than providing a Barnet consequential. So they've done that since and, and um, uh, have agreed to do so this financial year, although it's, it's not yet clear if that funding will continue longer term. Um, and so that all those listening can understand, can you just... Um, uh, particularly those who are outside Scotland who, who may not have the same familiarity. Can you explain what, the, what you mean by Barnet consequential funding? Um, yes, uh, well, the, the Barnet formula is, is a formula that, that's used to allocate funding from the UK government to the devolved administrations, which was established many years ago. And, and it, it sets out um, that, for example, if, if the, the UK government provides um, additional funding for something that's in a devolved area, then, then a, a proportion of that funding should be allocated to the devolved administrations. And then in, in terms of, of quantifying the amount which um, is, is provided by the Department of Health and Social Care to the Scottish Government, um, is, is this right, that, that it reflects what the Department of Health and Social Care will pay in respect of HIV through the English Infected Blood Support Scheme? And then there is, as it were, a pro rata calculation 
um, according to the number of, of Scottish beneficiaries. Is that broadly accurate? Yes. Does that then constrain or restrict the Scottish Government's ability to provide the support it might wish to the HIV-infected population in Scotland? Do you want me to take that? Um, no, um, it, it doesn't because we, we um, set, set our funding, you know, based on, on the funding we think we'll get. There is a slight difficulty um, in that normally we only get told how much funding, HIV funding we will get in around December of each year. Um, so, so, you know, the, we've obviously had to um, provide allocations and budget for, for SIPs long before that. Um, for, for that financial year. So that, that makes it slightly difficult sometimes to, to calculate um, exactly um, how much budget we'll have available. But that's something we work out internally with our finance if we end up um, overspending. And has the Scottish Government ever sought increased HIV funding from the Department of Health and Social Care? No, I, I've maybe raised concerns about when it's it's been less than we've expected, but 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 yeah, effectively, um, there's there's not much we can do about it if, at that stage. If if we look at a, a, a document EIBS four zero seven zero four, please show me. Um, and if we go to the next page, please. Paragraph 7 um, says this. Um, At present, the Department of Health and Social Care funds core and discretionary payments to those infected with HIV. This is a historical arrangement as the McFarlane and Eileen Trusts, which initially distributed these payments, predated devolution. Funding for this has since remained in DHSC's budget, which I think reflects what the, the explanation you gave us, Ms. Baker. And then this, going forward, DHSC does not have the funds to continue to provide this support. And then there's a reference to the inclusion of an amount in the costings that the Scottish Government was submitting um, to um, the Westminster Government. Um, so is this right that the Scottish Government has been informed that the Department of Health and Social Care will, will not be continuing to provide this support? Um, no, well, that was the position at the time this was written, which I think was sort of end of July, early August last year. Um, we were told when we were doing the, the parity calculations at the time that we should include funds for the HIV payments as, as the Department of Health felt that they wouldn't have funding for that. Um, however, since then, um, I think at the end of April, um, the Department of Health did confirm that they would be providing HIV funding for this year as it's something that I've raised with them um, in terms of trying to, to ensure clarity on that. Um, so, so as I say, they, they are providing the funding this year, um, although it's, it's not clear if that will funding will continue in future years. Okay. So is, is this right then? Um, th there's, there's been no longer term commitment from the Department of Health and Social Care to continue this arrangement? No. No, and, and um, yeah, we've, we've agreed it's something we need to discuss further in future, but yeah, unfortunately, there's, there's no commitment from them. Uh, and then, um, more, more generally, does the fact that currently, at least, the funding of the uh, of SIBS um, depends in part on funding received from the Department of Health and Social Care, d does does that department or, 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 or the Westminster government more generally um, um, have an influence or, or say in any respect over the policy and operation of the scheme? Ms. Ms. Goujon? That, sorry, not, certainly not as far as I'm aware, no. Uh, Ms. Baker? No, no, they, they don't. And we can take that down. And before before we break, just just one further um, area of questioning on 
that the issue of a longer term commitment. You've explained to us that there isn't a longer term commitment presently, at least from the Department of Health and Social Care to the HIV element. Um, wh what kind of commitment can the Scottish Government give more generally that it will continue to provide financial support to beneficiaries for their lifetime and the lifetime of their, their partners? Ms. Goujon, is that something the government is, is able to, to, to give some form of promise or commitment to? Well, we, we have committed to that. And I suppose I'm in a difficult situation right now. I may not be in this position over the course of the next couple of days, and it's not for me to take a decision for any future government. But I think it's been, uh, we've made that clear since the, the establishment of the scheme that, that we would be committed to that. And I would hope that whoever's in my post would uh, exactly would make that same commitment. Ms. Baker. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm aware that, that some um, of the campaigners have raised concerns that, that um, for example, a future administration could choose to make changes to the scheme, and, and obviously um, the Scottish Government could, couldn't guarantee what, what a future administration might do, but I would be pretty confident that, that um, future ministers would want to continue to support the scheme, and, and certainly current ministers have always seen this as a, as a, as an arrangement for the, the rest of the beneficiary's life. So I wouldn't expect any future administration to want to change that. But just to say, I think it just comes back to what we talked about earlier and about the moral duty and obligation that I think governments have um, to, to care for people um, and, to, and to provide for them in these circumstances, so I, I would certainly imagine that that would be continued. Um, sir, I note the time. I've still got a number of questions to ask, so would this be a convenient moment for a break? Uh, yes, yes it would. Um, let, let me ju just say to, to uh, each of you that uh, we normally have a break uh, during the, the morning. Uh, it allows uh, those who, who are watching remotely in particular uh, to have uh, refreshment if they want, uh, it allows us that privilege too. Uh, but during any break uh, in this inquiry, I, I always tell witnesses, whoever they are, that they, what they must not do is discuss uh, anything which they have said in evidence or they think they may yet be asked about in evidence with anyone, whoever they are. They can talk about anything else they like. And that, that rule applies just as much to you as it does to anyone else. But I look forward to seeing you back. Uh, it'll be uh, half an hour, so let's say quarter to 12. Thank you, sir.